879 is back into position, uh, runway 23 for takeoff, and I'll, uh, I'll wait for the traffic to clear the runway. Clear line traffic, 77 Delta, clear. Tanker 879 rolling. Copy 879, I have you at 1524. Runway traffic system 5, Victor Echoes, 5 east, uh, tracking eastbound, climbing through 4300. Rolling dispatch, Tanker 879, National Plane. Tanker 879 is off correlated at this time and route to the Alder Creek fire. My name is Steve Willie. I uh, fly single engine air tankers for Queen Bee Air Specialties out of Rigby, Idaho. I have nine seasons of crop dusting, seven seasons of firefighting, and I think about 19 years. I've been flying now. A typical airspeed uh, uh, cruise 150 miles per hour. Um, our drop speeds are uh, kind of like a landing configuration, um, 120 miles per hour, uh, full flaps. We're a little slower than a heavy air tanker, but we can work off of airfields closer to the fire. I'm comfortable in a, on a 4,000 foot strip, and you know, with five minute turn times, we can just we can haul a lot more retardant uh, in less time. My name is Joe Bates. I'm the Aviation Safety Program Manager for the Bureau of Land Management. I've been in fire for 36 years, a lot of time on the districts in hell attack, hot shots, AFMO and FMO and air attack for the last 22 years. Seat tanks have the ability through the computer settings to, to put out 50 gallons, 100 gallons, 200 gallons at a shot. They can do a fair, a fair amount of artwork. An 800 gallon seat can, can do eight 100 gallon drops um, if that's what you want them to do. So. Um, you're not looking at coming in to drop 800 gallons on a single tree. Um, you just can't do that. You, you'd probably have to come over and drop uh, 200 gallons four times or something. So those are the things that they need to think about as opposed to a heavy helicopter coming out and you know letting 2,000 gallons of water out in one spot. What we're going to try to do at this time is uh, on the eastern side of the fire, we're um, backing down into Bedrock Canyon here. South and east side of the fire, so the uh, will be the uh, right shoulder, and there's a house down in there, correct? You really need to put some thought into briefing the seat pilot and what the components of your briefing should be, and you should try and be consistent with that briefing from, from pilot to pilot, airplane to airplane. When the airplane's coming on scene, um, the first thing you want to do with them is establish communication. Uh, you want to be able to describe to them the location um, uh, that they're going to be working on the fire. And we like to try and stay away from cardinal points just because a lot of times, uh, especially on the ground, if you don't have a compass out, you know, your north may be, um, uh, may be east in the airplane and, and vice versa, depending on the workload. They understand the ICS system. They understand um, how we lay out a fire by, by the, uh, uh, the heel, by the shoulder, by the head, etc target description things, do you want to go direct, you know, on this hot snag, or do you want us to build a line around the snag? Um, do you want us to reinforce a line below it, um, above it, you know, exactly what do you want? Um, the type of drop and the coverage level, so do you want the whole load, do you want half the load, coverage level two, three, or four? Um, what hazards might be out there, and that's really a big one. Next, you want to be able to um, make sure that they understand whether the line is clear, whether the line is not clear. And if they don't ask you that, don't, don't make that assumption. You need to, to tell them whether or not the line is clear so that they can uh, drop safe. Um, what I would like to hear, what their overall objective is and what they're trying to accomplish with the fire, where their priorities are. Some sort of briefing, not just do whatever you think. That's what I don't want to hear. What I think may not be what they have in mind. And I don't see everything on the ground. I don't know where the firefighters are. Uh, I'd like to know where they're at in relation to the fire. Uh, that would help me out a lot as well. Tanker 879, Mossberg. Go ahead, Mossberg. Four, four. Tanker 
heads up on the possible hazards. Uh, the power lines just don't get too close to one. Point two one two five. Okay, thanks. And uh, what would you like to have us do on this one? Looks like you've got a pretty large tree uh, smoldering there. Is it much bigger on the ground? A direct suppression hit on the tree, and all of the fire activity is in the tree. There's very little on the ground. If the area is clear, I'll go ahead and uh, make my run and go live. 110.9. We will be clear of the area and we'll reassess after the first drop. Okay, sounds good. And I'll be uh, setting up for the downwind for the live run. The gate is armed and you, the line is clear. I think the most critical phase of flight is probably just prior to the drop is when we're, our airspeeds are slow, our power is um, usually at an idle or back, and our, our concentration is on what's out in front of us, um, looking for anything that might have been missed or overlooked, uh, whether it's snags or power lines, um, anything like that, other aircraft. The single pilot cockpit with a, with a seat, you're, you're just a little bit doubled up on the workload. You're still having to manipulate the controls of the aircraft, potentially reprogram a radio, change frequencies, things like that. The single pilot um, is, is handling all of the tasks of that aircraft uh, that are required to fly that aircraft uh, all on his own. Uh, he doesn't have a co-pilot or somebody to help him handle radio calls. The, the worst place to get a radio call is short final to the drop. Seconds before the drop is probably the worst, the worst, worst time to get a radio call or, or anything like that. Um, it's very distracting because uh, you're constantly cross-checking your gauges and, uh, and terrain and obstacles, uh, you know, trying to make sure you're not descending too low over the canopy, uh, getting too close to the trees or, or whatever you're dropping over. And the 802 isn't uh, a hands-off flying airplane. It, it requires hands-on all the time. If you let go of the stick, the airplane will just start uh, pitching and rolling. You just need to provide them some feedback on uh, on how the drop was. Was the drop long? Was it short? You think maybe they're going too fast, uh, too high, too low? Um, and be honest, uh, part of the problem that we're having sometime is, is we get into this mode where we tell everybody, hey, this is a good drop, load and return, and that just gets to be the standard that we utilize when really we could be providing a lot more accurate feedback. They want that feedback um, because they take pride in their work and, and they want to do it the right way. What I want to hear after a drop from the firefighters on the ground is um, uh, accuracy, you know, if, if I was late or early, um, wind drift, if it drifted off target, those are the things that help me uh, come back and make another drop. Is this where you wanted, you know, the drop to start? Um, um, did, did it uh, tie into the previous drop? Uh, was there good overlap there? And are we building, you know, good, strong, secure fire line? A good retardant drop should have just minimal forward momentum. I mean, if you can get it to come down like rain, that's a good retardant drop. Um, and you can tell sometime if they've, if they've dropped uh, too low, too fast, you can get some what they call shadowing. So if you have vertical fuels there on the ground, sagebrush, um, grass, whatever, that's standing up and just one side of that fuel is coated, then that's referred to as shadowing. So that, that's an ineffective drop because the back side of the fuel isn't coated and the fire has the ability to, to burn through your line because of that. A lot of times you can look and see, you know, if there's actually been vegetation disturbed on the ground, broken or something, then that, that obviously is, is the result of a, a drop that's too low. You know, the minimum drop height is 60 feet. The most effective drop height is 80 to 100 feet. In a single engine air tanker, the wingspan is right at 60 feet. So if you look at it from wingtip to wingtip, um, and you visualize that airplane of being on its side, 
that's the, you know, roughly a good rule of thumb for what the minimum drop height of 60 feet is. If, if you have 40 foot vegetation, um, that doesn't mean that you should be dropping 20 feet over it. That means you should be dropping 60 foot minimum above the top of that 40 foot tree. We're there to help them on the ground. Uh, that, that that's what I, my goal is to help the guys on the ground and do, and to support them. That's my last word. <laughs> I'm there for them. Dispatch, Tanker 879, National. Nine, go ahead. 879's on the ground, accordingly.